Well, good morning. If you want to open up your Bibles to Matthew chapter 7. Um, shocker, I know. I said I would finish the Sermon on the Mount this morning, and I need one more lesson. Uh, <laughs> I know. But come on. If I've taken this long to get through the Sermon on the Mount, I don't want to have to rush for the last lesson. So there's a couple of things that, um, that I think that we should not rush through. Um, so that's, that's where I am today. We'll be in Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 through 20. And if you want to just look in your Bible at Matthew chapter 7, starting at verse 13, in my English Standard Version, I have a terrible um, break in the text. It might be something helpful for you to, uh, to mark this in your Bible so that you see it. It says above verse 12 in my Bible, the golden rule, which is what we did last Sunday. Whatever you wish others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophet. And then under this same heading, it's our very first thing that we're going to talk about today. I think there should be another heading above verse 13 that talks about the two ways. And what we're going to do for today and tomorrow is look at... Um, four conclusions. There are four separate stories at the end of the Sermon on the Mount that all basically say the same thing. They all say do or die. Um, they all say, here's the message of the Sermon on the Mount. Now do it. But, but there is a nice progression. And, and what, I, what I wanted to do, what I planned on doing, was to say, here's the message. Do it. Do the Sermon on the Mount. But one thing that I've learned in the last week, at least, um, of, of preparing for this material, is that it's not that they all just say, here's the Sermon on the Mount, now do it. There is this, this progression to how Jesus tells the conclusion of the Sermon on the Mount. And, and I'm excited about that, and I, I want to talk about that. Uh, and so we're going to start. In verses 13 and 14, with Jesus talking about the two ways. In verse 13, enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide, and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow, and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. If I was going to do one lesson on... Only this section of the Sermon on the Mount. Then what I would do is I would break it into four sections. There are four main elements to what's going on here. The first is the gate. And, and that's automatically something that shakes me up just a little bit. Because my natural way of thinking about um, this text is to think about the narrow way. That if you were to ask me, what's just without reading the text, just from memory... What's this story, this section of the narrow way about? Um, Jesus says the way is narrow and there are a few who find it. And so if I walk on the narrow way, then I will get to enter the gate of heaven at the end of the road. Or if I walk on the wide way where there's lots of people and the way is broad and it's easy, then I will enter the gate of hell at the end of the road. But it seems to me like Jesus is saying that the gate comes first. You pass through the gate to get onto the way. And I know it's not a huge um, difference from what I said just a second ago. But there is a difference. Enter by the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow. Enter by the gate, the narrow gate, to get onto the way that's hard, that leads to life, and those who find it are few. And so, um, this is one thing that's been helpful for me, to think about this text at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. I have a picture of two ways. All of us. All of us do. We have a choice after listening to what Jesus has said. We can do things through Jesus and the way of the Sermon on the Mount or, or literally everything else or not. Uh, 
If you want to go through Jesus, that gate's narrow. And the way that I think about the, the narrow gate is, if I'm going to go through Jesus and I'm going to walk on this narrow road, I can't pack all my bags and bring my stuff. Here's a little narrow gate, and I'm squeezing through this thing, and I've got to leave everything in the past if I'm going to walk the Jesus way. If I'm going to come to the Lord through, through Christ, I'm not going to fit with all my stuff. If you want to go the wide way, if you want to go through the wide gate that everybody else goes through, bring all the stuff you want. Everything will fit. Pack your bag, pack your car, load a trailer. It'll all fit in the wide way. You don't have to do anything different. Just go on the wide way. If you want to come the way of Jesus, though, that gate's narrow, and you've got to leave all your stuff behind. When you pass through the narrow gate, the second thing then, which um, I, I've always treated the way as the main piece of the story. kind of seems like the gate is maybe the main piece of the story, but the way is the second one. The gate is wide, and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many, for the gate is narrow, and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. So if I'm going to go um, the broad gateway, I bring all of my stuff, I pack a trailer, I go through the broad gate, and that road is wide. It's a six-lane highway to hell. I can, there's no boundaries. I can just walk wherever I want, however I want, because it's a big road. And there's plenty of room for lots of people. Most people go on the big road. I'm thinking about something like a Los Angeles interstate here. Really big road. But the Jesus way, the narrow gate is, once I leave all of my stuff behind and I squeeze through the Jesus gate, now I'm on the Jesus way, which is the Sermon on the Mount, and there are curbs and boundary markers along the way. And it's a narrow way. And as I walk on the narrow way, I don't just get to waver and wobble any direction I want. I'm going to walk this road. And you can see with the two ways what Jesus says. He says this way over here, the big way, that's easy. That's probably why most people go that way is because it's not hard. The narrow way, though, is difficult. It's tough to stay in between the lines and to stay on the path. With the narrow way, the thing that comes into my head is that... Um, I don't remember what Indiana Jones it was, but do you remember the one Indiana Jones where he had to walk across the invisible bridge? That's hard, and it's narrow. Uh, that's the one that pops into my head. So you've got the gate, you've got the way, you've got the people who go, uh, the crowds, if you will, the, the third group. On the narrow way, the people who go through the big gate, the people who walk on the broad way, there are lots of them. This is the way of most people. Um, the narrow gate, on the other hand, uh, the people who find it, the people who are willing to walk it, the people who actually do walk it, are few. There's not very many. And, and I, don't, I don't presume, it seems to me that preachers especially historically get themselves in trouble with this right now. Because there is one thing that it seems every preacher across the board always says. And it seems like there's always somebody who just gets really upset about this. Uh, whenever we start talking about those who are many go the broad way. Those who are few go the narrow way. And then I start pointing the picture and I'm like, not even most of you are going to be on this. I'm not in the business of deciding what's going on here, but, but big picture wise, big picture wise, what we can do is we can say the broad way that's easy, that's not the way of Jesus, that's not the Sermon on the Mount, most people go that direction. That's, I mean, that's just an undeniable fact. Most people go that way. The narrow gate, the narrow Jesus gate, the narrow way that's hard to walk, 
Few people are willing to go that way. And I would suggest, I mean, I've, I've seen it myself, and I've listened to you say these things as we've gone through the Sermon on the Mount. After every single lesson, after talking about all of this for the last 32 Sunday mornings, the last 32 lessons that we've done the, the Sermon on the Mount, some of you have at least come up to me after every lesson and said, whoa, that's hard. That's that's, that's going to mean I'm going to have to turn my life upside down and do some hard stuff and a lot of things differently. And the reality of that situation is there are just not very many people willing to do it. So you've got the gate, you've got the way, you've got the crowd, and then you've got the destination. The Broadway ends in destruction. This is a word that's used throughout the New Testament to uh, refer to hell. You go the Broadway... It's easy now. It ends in hell. You go the narrow way, through the narrow gate, the Sermon on the Mount, few people find it. The end um, is life. Would you turn in your Bibles with me to Deuteronomy chapter 30? In Deuteronomy chapter 30, I just, I don't want to read all of these references, but this idea of there being only two ways is something that you see all through the, new, uh, the Bible, the, the Old Testament and the New Testament. Um, Deuteronomy 30 is my favorite. So I'm just going to read, I'm going to read verses 11 through 20. This is Moses at, I mean, almost at the end of everything that he wrote. He says, this commandment that I command you today is not too hard for you, neither is it far off. It is not in heaven that you should say, who will ascend to heaven for us, to bring it for us, that we may hear it and do it. You notice that as far back as the time of Moses, there are people who heard the word of God and said, ooh, that's way too hard. Ooh, that's, that's not accessible. That's not doable. And what Moses is doing, I think, in what he says is he's acknowledging that it is hard, but he says, it's not in heaven. It's not like you can say, it's way up there and I can't attain it. I can't achieve it. He says, it's not up there in verse 13. Neither is it beyond the sea that you should say, who will go over the sea for us to bring it to us in order that we may hear it. But the word is very near you. It is in your mouth. It is in your heart so that you can do it. See, I have set before you today life and good, death and evil. It's the two ways. Here is the word of God. One way is the way of life. One way is the way of death and destruction. Um, verse 16, if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God that I command you today, by loving the Lord your God, by walking in his ways, by keeping his commandments and his statutes and his rules, then you shall live and multiply. And the Lord your God will bless you in the land that you are entering to take possession of it. But if your heart turns away and you will not hear, but are drawn away to worship other gods and serve them, I declare to you today that you shall surely perish. You shall not live long in the land that you're going over the Jordan to enter and to possess. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. And he finishes by saying to this group of people, I want you to choose the way of life. There's two ways for all of us. But he says, now, therefore, choose life. That you and your offspring may live loving the Lord your God, obeying his voice, holding fast to him. For he is your life and length of your days that you may dwell in the land that the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, uh, to give them. And you, you'll see this all the way through the Bible, that there are only two ways. This picture, after, after describing what we've done, this picture is not really an accurate picture, you know, from what we've... There's no gates and the ways look like they're the same distance. But you can see a summary from the picture on the board behind me right now. One is the way that most people choose to go. That's the popular way. We don't decide what we're going to do and how we're going to live based upon what most other people do. 
most other people are going the wrong direction. They're on the Broadway, and we know that that place ends in hell. There is no middle way. There's only two gates. There's only two paths. That's why I like the idea of the gate at the start of the path. Because it, if you think about the path that's narrow and the path that's broad that ends in a gate, then what you can see me doing is straddling both of the paths until I get to the end of the road and then I jump onto the narrow one and walk through the gate. What Jesus is saying is go through the narrow gate and then walk this path. There is no middle way that spans both of these two paths. You choose one or the other. There's only two ways. And it's the way of the Sermon on the Mount. It's the way of Jesus. Jesus said a couple passages, John chapter 14 and verse 6, I am the way, I am the way, and the truth and the life. Nobody comes to the Father but through me. He's the gate. And his way, the Sermon on the Mount, is the narrow way. Acts chapter 4 and verse 12, There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Um, in Matthew chapter 7 here, when you see verses 13 and 14, you know, I just put a little line there. Since my Bible doesn't make a separation for me, I put a little line there to make my own separation to say, this is the start of the end. This is Jesus after he said everything that he intends to say in this sermon. And he says, you're either going to choose to do it or you're not. You're either going to choose to walk this path or you're going to choose to walk every other path that exists. That choice is before every single one of us. Verse 15 moves us into a new section. And what I think that we should do is connect what we just read with what Jesus is going to say in verse 15. He says, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing. Now, now we will come back to this and we'll talk about this. But turn over to Jeremiah chapter 23. Because when I think of a false prophet, the thing that just naturally comes into my head before everything else is to think of somebody who is saying something that is anti-God and, and not true. And, and sure enough, that, that is the way of the false prophet. But throughout the Old Testament, you see one trait more than any other trait that marks out the false prophet. The false prophet in the Old Testament is called the prophet of peace. And what the false prophet says, you can see here in Jeremiah, is, you know what? Jesus has laid out this narrow gate and this narrow way, and it's the only way, and there's not very many people who find it, and it's the only way to life. The prophet of peace says, in regards to God's message, he says, eh, that just sounds a little too extreme. I think we'll be all right if we just go over to the Broadway. It's easier after all. It's the prophet of peace. It's the person who says things are not really that bad. Look at verses 1 and 2 just so you can see who he's talking to and about here. He says, Woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, declares the Lord. Therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning the shepherds who care for my people, you have scattered my flock and driven them away. And so the leaders of God's people in verses 11 through 14, it's not just the leaders, but it's the priests and the prophets. Both prophet and priest are ungodly, even in my house. I have found their evil, declares the Lord. And so there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a whole batch of bad apples in God's family at this point. Look at verses 16 and 17. Thus says the Lord of hosts, Do not listen to the words of the prophets who prophesy to you, filling you with vain hopes. That's their problem. That's how they're leading Israel astray, is that they're filling people with hope that is not real hope. 
And they're saying things to encourage people that is not real encouragement. He says, they speak visions of their own minds, not from the mouth of the Lord. They say continually to those who despise the word of the Lord, it will be well with you. This is what happened. There are people who despise the word of God and the false prophets say, don't listen to them. It's going to be fine. It's going to be all right. And to everyone who stubbornly follows his own heart, they say, no disaster will come upon you. It's going to be fine. Don't worry about this. There's no destruction at the end of the wide road that's easy that everybody takes. That's the message of the false prophet in verse 22. If they had stood in my counsel, then they would have proclaimed my words to the people. And they would have turned them from their evil way and from their evil deeds. Go back to Matthew chapter 5 with me at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. And think about, with every single one of these things that Jesus has said throughout the Sermon on the Mount, uh, every one of us, I don't want to put this in your boat, I don't know, maybe not every one of us, I at least, I read through what Jesus has said, and I am inclined to soften it. In fact, that's how the whole thing started. In verse 19, he says, Whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. Don't relax it. Don't water it down and muddy the water and soften the message. Say what Jesus said in verse 21. You have heard that it was said of old, You shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to the judgment. But I say to you, Everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. And, and the inclination is to say, but are you really going to be in trouble with God if you're angry with your brother? I mean, come on. And we say, that's what Jesus said. Don't water it down. That's what the prophet of peace does. The prophet of peace says, yeah, but I mean, sometimes we get upset. It's natural. In verse 27, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. And we say, yeah, but it's not real adultery. I mean, it's bad. Don't get me wrong. It's bad and we shouldn't do it. But it's not real adultery actual, literal adultery. And what Jesus is saying is, the end result is the same. And we shouldn't water that down. In verse 31, here's one for our world. It was said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But Jesus says, and this is my summary of what Jesus says in verse 32, whoever divorces his wife, God said no divorce. And we say, yeah. But it's a complicated world that we live in, and God wants me to be happy after all. The prophet of peace is the one who takes the word of God and softens it and muddies it. And what Jesus is saying here in verse 15 is there are two ways which we've described. And he follows that with... Beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. The false prophet is the one who's going to muddy the difference between these two ways. And, and this one's a little bit scary whenever you think about it. Because earlier in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, don't give what's holy to dogs. It's easy to see the dogs. And he said, don't cast your pearls before swine. It's easy to know what a pig is. Um... These prophets, though, who soften the message and muddy the water between the two ways, they look like us. They, they are ravenous wolves who are here to destroy the flock, but they look like sheep. And so the next section of this text is, how are we supposed to know the difference? Who are we supposed to follow? And he tells us in verses 16 and following, you will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree 
bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. How do we recognize the true prophet from the false prophet? Ryan Awad said to me just two days ago, I think it was, test show results. <laughs> and I didn't like the context that he said that to me in, and I still don't like what he said to me, but this is what Jesus is saying. You know a person by what they produce. The test shows the result. And it's not, it's not an easy thing to say. It's not an easy thing to look at a person and say, I mean, what you've produced is not good. I don't want to say that to somebody. But it's not hard to recognize either. Especially, especially, I'm going to skip over these couple of quotes. Especially since God has used this illustration multiple times to tell us the exact same thing about looking at a person's fruit in Matthew chapter 12, later on in this book, starting in verse 33. Uh, either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad. For the tree is known by its fruit. You brood of vipers, how can you speak good when you are evil? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The good person out of his good treasure brings forth good. The evil person out of his evil treasure brings forth evil. I tell you on the day of judgment, people will give an account for every careless word they speak. For by your words, you will be justified and by your words, you will be condemned. We can say all day long, I'm not a bad person. I'm mostly a good person. But at least in regards to this text, uh, your words are the thing that reveal the truth. Do you speak good or do you speak bad? That's, that's just the bottom line. What fruit do you bear? There's another place, and, and this one, I mean, this is not the only one that I would turn to, but this is probably the easiest one that we might go to, where Paul has specifically said the words, this is the fruit that the Spirit produces. So the question is, am I producing this fruit, or am I producing something else? There's the works of the flesh, and, and you can see with the Sermon on the Mount, sexual immorality, purity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery. But look at, look at the rest of this list. Is the fruit of your life and your relationships with other people and your spouse and your family and everybody else that you're connected with, are you constantly surrounded by enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions? Those are the fruit that a not spiritual person produces. We can say, oh, that person is just super spiritual, super good, because after all, look at this. Do they produce that? No, they're not. You'll know them by their fruit. And the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. These are the fruit that show if a person is what they're supposed to be. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 14. Remind them of these things. Charge them before God not to quarrel about words. Is a person argumentative, constantly argumentative, constantly bickering about something? That's their fruit. And it's not good fruit. Don't argue about words, which does no good, but only ruins the hearer. Is there a path of destruction left in their wake? That's their fruit. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. Avoid irreverent babble, for it will lead people into more and more ungodliness, and their talk will spread like gangrene. Is that the fruit that we've seen? Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus, who have swerved from the truth. That's fruit saying that the resurrection has already happened. They're upsetting the faith of other people. That's fruit. Jesus says you will know them by their fruit. And so let's read our text at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus 
has said all the way, starting in chapter 5 through now. Verse 13. I think we started on August 8th talking about that. Every single point, every single lesson, Jesus finishes it up by saying, enter by the narrow gate. The Mandalorian would say about the Sermon on the Mount, this is the way. Enter by the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. Beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. If you're here today and you're not a Christian... This point in our study of the Sermon on the Mount is calling for a decision. This is, um, this is your action item at the end of the lesson, at the end of the meeting. Are you going to do it or not? Are you going to pass through this gate or are you going to keep going through the gate that everybody else goes through? Are you going to make a decision to walk the hard way with Jesus or are you going to make the decision to keep doing things your own way? You know where the two... Roads end, but it's time to make a decision. If you're here today and you're ready to hand your life over to Christ, to die to yourself and be buried in the waters of baptism, coming up out of that watery grave to walk the narrow road, to walk in newness of life, we'd love to help you with that today. Come forward, make your needs known as together we stand and sing the invitations.